as you are aware, modern time Esperanto is called Global English or Globish. So for those of you who have never been into Benin, I will give you a flavor of Benin by speaking Globish with a Beninese accent. <laughs> so uh, I really trust you will uh, like it. Let me start by those three seemingly undated satellite images, A, B, C, from Zinzia region in Niger, a country north of Benin, sharing the northern part, uh, border of Benin and Nigeria. Given all that you have heard about, the challenges of drought, of food insecurity, and of desertification and hunger, the test here is to find the right chronology of those three satellite images, the, knowing that the dates are 1955, 1975, and 2005. Which satellite image is the most recent one? You may be inclined to say it's image A. Oh, they are bright men here. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's image C, uh, and, and maybe you have been guided by the settlement density, but it's also image C. As you can see, the dynamics of land use and vegetation in the southwest of the Republic of Niger is challenging our belief and perception about the Sahel. You see, here we have another those are two views. This one, taken on the same place, but field view, in 1980, and this one is 2000. You can see the difference. That thriving landscape in those regions is possible. More people, more trees, more livestock, in a more food secure and resilient rural community is, is possible and is happening in that region. So society degrade, society can restore. The land title deed you hold also makes you custodian of its soil functions as a global common for present and future generation. Although we often equate soil to dirt, it is the most valuable geo resource of mankind. One of my favorite quotes of, about soil is that of President F.D. Roosevelt, that the nation who destroy its soil destroy itself, unquote. The dust bowl of the 1930s had taught his generation a tough lesson and hope that we will never forget those type of lessons. We need to realize at local, national, and global levels that land stewardship is not an option, but an imperative for human security and global sustainability. And I hope that our today discussion and conversation will contribute to that, and I, as I look forward to your uh, feedback as well. So I would like to discuss it through those four points, land development and land use change progress or degradation, and how land degradation threatens human security and global sustainability, and why we should restore more than we degrade, and what might be the option in the context of the sustainable development goals. Since Neolithic times and true land use and land use change, soil has been the primary natural capital generations have used for the provisioning of food, feed, for the fiber, for building their other capitals, being human capital, financial capital, and infrastructure, etc. So prior to global warming to which land use and land use change has contributed, it is through land use change that humanity has entered into the Anthropocene and transformed the biosphere. As we can see from this slide nowadays, more than half of the natural habitat of the planet has been transformed into cropland and rangeland, 
with a first acceleration in the middle of the 18th century, driven by population growth and also by the increasing standardization of, at global scale of agricultural schemes, largely imported from Europe, often replicated regardless of local context and land capacity and soil features and potential. The second acceleration tipping point has occurred in the mid of the 20th century, concomitantly with uh, urbanization, as you can see on that slide. And by the end of the century, meaning by the end of the last century, new competing claims for land use have emerged with growing demand for agrofuels, I prefer to call them agrofuels than biofuels, and biomaterial supply. With development and land use change came its mismanagement and ultimately land degradation leading to man-made barren land. In the mid of the 19th century, the French novelist Chateaubriand wrote, and quote, forests precede civilization and deserts follow them, unquote, highlighting that mankind is a desert-making species. Since then, the process of degradation has accelerated due to a growing human population and changes towards high carbon production and consumption patterns, agriculture has spread, causing forests to further retreat and the depletion of natural habitat. This is how some additional 30% of global forest cover has been completely cleared and a further 20% has been degraded. Nowadays, agriculture occupies 50% of the earth land area with about one third of cropland and two thirds of grazing land. As David Pimentel, who, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the Cornell University faculty members, wrote in a publication last year, the nearly 1.5 billion hectare of world cropland now under cultivation for crop production are almost equal in area to the amount of cropland, two billion hectares, that has been abandoned by humans since farming began, unquote. That is the equivalent of the combined land area of the US and Canada. That's the legacy of the historical, historical mismanagement of cropland worldwide. In that process, ecosystem characteristic has been changed, vegetation removed, natural species replaced by functional species, and driven by urbanization, land is built up and soil surface is sealed. Actually, the, the most protected soil are those who have been sealed, but they are useless for us. And let us bear in mind that urban expansion is occurring at, by up to 80% in prime agricultural land. So let us consider this slide. It shows in 2010 context land use per ecosystem type. And you can see if you, the square represents, let's say, the total global terrestrial surface of about 132 million square kilometers subdivided in the major ecosystem type. The red part of the left is this one, this red part of the left, is converted into Arab land. The orange part, this one, is converted, maybe I can do it from here, okay. The, the, the orange part has been converted into grazing land for livestock. The brown part in the right, side is in use for forestry. And the green in the middle represents the remaining natural land, although it might be somehow affected by degradation. And the white line you can see is showing or marking the potential of land suitable for agriculture in every type of ecosystem. The gray, the gray zone is a rough estimate of degradation of landscape which are no more productive. This has not been well mapped since then, but there are so many guest estimates about that. 
And degradation processes continue to accelerate as if land is not a finite resource. But it is finite. And we know its limit. Globally, land degradation seems to have intensified in the 1990s, following the worldwide green revolution of the 1960s, accelerating cropland expansion into savannas and pristine forest. Total land degradation estimate, as I say, is not really much well known, and it ranges between 5 to 40 percent. 5 percent to 40 percent of global land mass is creating different definition and dimension of degradation using different criteria, thresholds, baseline. For instance, 9 percent of the total land mass under cultivation, if you take the definition of reduced soil productivity, the estimate is that it is 9%. When you take the one provided by FAO in 2011 under the soil and the state of soil and land, soil, state of land and water, uh, then it is up to 33% under this definition, moderately to severely degraded with losses in soil quality water redemption and or biodiversity, unquote. So it, it means that the definitions are not commonly shared and we are working on guest estimate. You can see that uh, there are other estimates like from the UN, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program yearbook of 2012, and I read, in certain areas, conventional and intensive agriculture are triggering soil erosion rates to some 100 times greater than the rate at which nature can regenerate soil. And FAO has released another assessment that was in 2008 that over the past quarter century, between 1981 to 2008, that 24% of the global land area has been degraded. This is almost equivalent to an average rate of 1% per year. Unsustainable. But at the same time, it's not convincing because we have so many divergences in estimate that people, especially when you take this to those who are making policies and from the private sector, you say, from 5 to 4 percent, 40 percent, it means you don't know what we're talking about. But what is degradation, therefore, in land management and land use processes? Land degradation should be a very well-defined and universally agreed concept given the risk and far-reaching negative socioeconomic and environmental impact attached to it. But surprisingly, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, this slide shows land use change and how it is a process regarding function change and trade-offs attached to it. You can see on the top you have an undisturbed state of forest or grassland, and you can see how from undisturbed state to extensive use and further to intensive use, how you move in consecutive negative trade-off towards a state of degradation. And this is it. Uh, so it is about trade-off in the process of land use change or land management. That's what the degradation is about. Is land use change equivalent to degradation? That's a good question for uh, that that should receive a clear, straightforward answer. What is a negative change or a degraded trend, and what is not? Against what land factor, land productivity indicators, ecosystem function and threshold? What user or stakeholder's interest should be prioritized? Farmer, forester, water manager, ecologist, or property developer? And what is the scale and time span to consider? Land user or even expert perception have often, often biased responses to those key questions. A crop land user mainly favors function producing short-term tangible goods 
such as food, fiber, for his private benefit. This often occurs to the detriment of some other functions, delivering long-term public and less tangible services, such as habitat species, biodiversity, or carbon sequestration. The value, good or bad, positive or negative, attached to the function change and threshold and trade-off involved might greatly differ from one stakeholder to the other. For instance, it is not easy to reconcile the perception of a, an ecologist concerned by species biodiversity and long-term benefit and that of a farmer whose earnings depend on much more short-term productivity consideration. The issue of spatial and temporal scales is a major, another major source of differences in the appreciation of trade-offs and related degradation estimate. Thus, land degradation decisions are about change and trade-offs in land function, which might lead to some declines, often undesired, or some loss of function to the point that the system might permanently or within a given time span lose its resilience, its capacity to self-regenerate self those functions. So, although its on-farm negative impacts are quite easily observable, especially when soil erosion occurs, land degradation appears to be a rather value and perception-laden concept, thus leading to different definitions, subjective judgment, diverging views, and estimate. This figure synthesizes the status and trend in global land degradation produced by FAO in 2011 in what they call State of Land and Water Report. It is to be noted in that, that you see they are classified in type. You have type one, high degradation and highly degraded trends. Type two, moderate degradation in slightly and moderately degraded land. Those two types, one and two, combined is equal to 33%. And type three is stable, but in slightly or moderately degraded land. And only 10% of the land has been assessed as improving, only 10%. But where is the land improving and why? According to what function and soil features? And to whose benefit? Obviously, these crucial questions are intertwined with those about degradation. Therefore, estimates here also vary widely. In his book, Seven Pillars of Ecosystem Management, Robert Leakey wrote in 1998 that, quote, we should avoid value-laden terms such as degradation unless they are accompanied with an explicit definition of what the desired con condition of the ecosystem is as defined by society, unquote. So unless this is defined, we can't afford to use value-laden <coughs> concepts and definition. But we therefore need to ensure that regarding degradation and restoration, the definitions are much more objective and the way of assessing them is replicable and then therefore comparable assessment can be run here and there. Consequently, and because the international community is still grappling with the issue of definition, the said, quote, desired condition, unquote, is a fragmentary manner, in a fragmentary manner is unfortunately yet not globally agreed. So we have no globally agreed understanding and agreement on what is the desired condition against which we will assess degradation and therefore advanced restoration. Fortunately, some initiatives are underway in order to address that issue and provide more objective and replicable responses. One of them, called the BEO, BEO project, is a partnership for biodiversity, ecosystem services, and development issues 
led by PBL, the Netherlands Environmental Agency, Environmental Assessment Agency, has endeavored to address the issue by rather mapping function change, one map per selected function. It means we also need to agree on what function we should select. And building on their working definition, they say that degradation should be only used when the following three conditions are met. One, all functions are, have declined. And two, the change is broadly seen as undesired or have no beneficiaries. And three, the system lost its capacity to self-regenerate its function permanently or within a few decennia. I like that. And it can be maybe a further more fine tune, but it seems to be replicable as well. Let's see the scale of the far reaching impact of land degradation. As you can see, they are often simultaneously social, economic, environmental, security, and political stability nature. So land degradation is not just about the environment. It also corrodes the pillars, all the pillars of sustainable development. So the confinement of land degradation issues to environment or agricultural sectors have indeed, has indeed done a disservice both to the issue, to the affected population, and to the ecosystems affected. The economics of land degradation, or ELD, another initiative underway to assess the global economic cost of land degradation, concluded in its interim report released September last year that the cost, the direct cost attached to on-site impact on net primary productivity is up to 5% of global agricultural GDP. But in some countries, it's up to 12% is affecting 12% of the agricultural GDP of countries like 9% in Burkina Faso, for instance. So, ladies and gentlemen, given all this, how does land degradation threaten human security? Human security concept has emerged and gained ground around the human development concept and its eponymous report produced by the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Here, security means freedom from fear, freedom from want, and freedom to live in dignity. Human security addresses human vulnerability and lack of resilience vis-a-vis -vis security threat and risk in areas such as economic, food, health, environmental, personal, political, and community. It is a people-centered, concept of security understood as necessary for national, regional, and global security and stability. It connects the two. So as a societal value, I believe that human security is about the trust and confidence that individuals have in the way their society ensures the protection, certain certainty, reliability, and predictability of all that they depend on all that they depend on. We know that land degradation directly jeopardizes the nature-based livelihood of a population affected. Because to summarize it uh, and paraphrase a friend of mine uh, whose name is Ben Tenbrick from PBL in Netherlands, he says land degradation de-vegetate, decarbonate, dehydrate, Dispatiate, deplete, deteriorate. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Therefore, land degradation highly strengthens human security because it directly impedes the processes that underpin the capacity of the terrestrial and coastal ecosystem, at least, to provide food, fiber, fuel, and water. It depletes the biodiversity and natural habitat that constitute the human life supporting system. In other words, land degradation is about the depletion of the resource base for ensuring human security and resilience. 
It increases vulnerability to climate change related shocks, especially in rural areas. So land degradation is a threat multiplier, a conflict generator, a push factor for environmentally induced migration. Let us look at how land degradation has added to drought hotspots in the world relate to conflict and environmentally induced migration. This is a map. I took it from a book uh, of Jeffrey Starch called Commonwealth. And in that book, he mapped uh, in 2007 context all the major episodes of political violence resulting in at least 500 directly related fatalities using uh, as source um, the Systemic Peace Center. And you can see that in 2007 context, eight out of 10 conflicts in the world were occurring in dry land. It's as if uh, following the fall of the Iron Wall, the dry land has become very much conflict prone. If you do the same map today, you will have more than eight out of 10 because you need to add Mali, we need to add the number of places, including Syria, and, and in some places, some of the root causes making those regions very conflict-prone are about uh, land-based or resource-based conflict, like land and water. And religion sometimes, or often, like in northern Nigeria, is coming as a, a kind of way for people to manipulate the context and you play uh, the power play manipulating people. Desertification is also a, a major source of environmentally induced migration, as you can see it from that map. Uh, when you look at the sources and when you map also land degradation, you will see that they are the land degradation hotspot in the world or vulnerability to it in the world are in those areas. Overly, land degradation degrades people's life. But fortunately, it's not a threat. This is what, has, what is occurring in Niger. Let me take you back to the first uh, slide I have used. That is in Zinder in Niger. At grassroots level, there are a number of amazing changes occurring and amazing innovation that we often overlook because we believe that innovation can't really come from grassroots level, especially in the developing world. But in the developing world, in that place in Niger, what they have started doing, which has generated that change you have seen in those three satellite images, has been labeled by scholars, like some, some of you, farmer managed natural regeneration. And it has helped or led to the regeneration of five million hectares of land in that, in Niger, and help regenerate 200 million trees, much more than all the tree planting program in Niger put together. And you can see the result. And now, of course, those success stories coming from the grassroots level, the point is to what extent policies is enhancing it. I put there a number of things that are needed to, to help scale it up. So farmer managed natural regeneration is, or FMNI is a very labor intensive agroforestry type of response to land degradation. I was on the field there uh, February last year and I met people. I asked a lady, why are you uh, investing so much time and hard work in doing this. And she gave me an example that has been different from what the, you know, the, the, the men there shared with me. She said, gentlemen, you know what? 10 years back, I have to walk half a day to fetch water. Because of what we have been doing for the last decade, now we have water available on our own site here because the water table jumped up by 14 meters, and that number, I got it confirmed by the researchers. 
So that's how re restoration could, can respond to degradation and therefore enhance human security. So my interim conclusion here is that enhancing soil anywhere enhances life everywhere because soil security, and I agree with you, Chris, is crucial for human security. Because soil security is site-specific, it calls for the, de the development of solutions that are embedded in local realities that have to be enhanced by or strengthened by national ownership and policies and, uh, and in, further enhanced by regional and global cooperation. Enhancing soil anywhere enhances life everywhere is a motto I have used a couple of years back to promote uh, the uh, um, World Day to Combat Desertification. So what about land in the context of sustainability? How does degradation threaten global sustainability? Well, I believe that the 21st century's conundrum is about how to feed a thirsty planet of 9 to 10 billion people in less than 40 years while we, at the same time, adapt to climate change and mitigate uh, to the extent possible. And at the same time, we are losing ground to degradation. And we are increasingly losing the spaces on the field, the population spaces, which are actually doing, the, those are the players doing the work for us. Uh, I used to ask, uh, you know, mayors uh, to build a statue uh, in the, you know, in the city for the worms, to let everyone know that we, we own so much to the worms and celebrate the worms. <laughs> it is not that the amount of land necessary to feed people by 2050 will expand. It will not. But by 2050, not only will be, there will be two additional billion people on the planet, but each one of them will be consuming averagely two to three times more than what we're consuming today. Will it be possible? So here is, uh, again, using uh, the, the figure of uh, that square uh, and mapping what land might be needed by 2050 to, uh, to fix or respond to the demands that are expected. And you can see that when you use, if we, we manage really to intensify agriculture, we may use this block, uh, estimated as some six million square kilometers. And if we fail, you may use double, but like some 12 million square kilometers. And this black block here is, is the estimate that more or less we may degrade then some five million square kilometers by then. So how, if you put all that together and you want to fit the, the additional demand and the degradation into the green zone in the middle, how do you fit those blocks? If you want to fit them all, you have no other green zone almost left. We can't afford that. So among the factors driving the increased demand for cropland, to be more specific, is the growing, is that there is the growth, I mean, the growth of uh, supply is increasing while the yield is decreasing. And climate change is actually accelerating that factor. And concomitantly, we are losing ground. And urban cities are taking more land on the fertile agricultural land. That's why under our site in 2008, land has become a global strategic commodity. We have seen the, the, the market responding to that demand by doing things, two things, 2008. They speculated on food staples, but the two second things that they, they, they did, the second one was to acquire land there have been large transactions of, of land in, from 2008 to 2009, estimated as some 
56 million hectares of land, approximately the size of France. I wish to put it in some size of uh, US state, but I can't. I, have, <laughs> I was expecting to have time to do that, but it's equal to the size of France, who has been acquired by some you know, investors. The question is, they have taken the risk to acquire land abroad, and there is a political risk attached to it, but they did that. So why is it that they have chosen to do that instead of also at least sharing the other avenue where it is about restoring what is already degraded? Because we used to say, well, it is the long term, it, it takes too much time, it's not reliable, so the, the, the market is not willing to invest into that. Why now the market, like in Madagascar, the land has been acquired, the, 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 the population opposed to that, and the government has been toppled. You may remember what happened to the government in Madagascar. On the consumption side, it has also been estimated that by 2030, the demand for food, energy, and water might increase by at least 50%, 45%, and 30% respectively. The total additional land demand for matching these needs by 2030 has been estimated in the wide range of 285 million to 792 million hectares. And in that context, land degradation accounted for up to 87 million hectares. This is an estimate from the UNEP um, International Resource Panel report. I think there will be a, a presentation about that tomorrow. I really recommend that report to you because it is a, a very uh, interesting one and I look forward to attending that panel uh, tomorrow morning. But according to the same report, here is uh, the projection for 2050 under business as usual. And you can see uh, that their estimate is much more optimistic regarding the demand, the additional demand than that of PBL. But despite of that, the estimate is that by 2050, we might need additional crop land the size of Brazil. By 2050, <laughs> well, just think about where we will find it. If we go business as usual, we will take it from the forest. Another assessment is that, and you can see it here, if we continue that way, if we consider that we need to halt uh, cropland expansion, if we really want to uh, stop uh, loss of biodiversity, we need to halt cropland ex expansion by 2020, uh, then the business as usual has already overshoot the safe of operating space. That's what I put here. You see, this is the gross expansion, which is about the net expansion here, plus compensation due to degradation and urban expansion. And you can see that if, if this is the gross expansion and if this is the operating space for cropland, we have already overshoot the safe operating space, according to the report. The safe operating space has been estimated to 0 0.20 hectare per person at the global level, given the planetary boundaries. So, how far are we from the target of 0 0.20 hectares per person? The report also provides uh, this and, uh, regarding the EU. The EU 27 countries, as you know, they do coordinate the agricultural uh, policies. But when you look at this one, where it, it, it is, you have here the 0 0.20, you can see that in the EU in 27, to, uh, 2007, sorry, the EU requires 0 0.45 hectare per person of global crop land or global agricultural land, which is one fifth more than EU domestic agricultural area. When you consider cropland, they have been using one third more than what is globally available per person already in 2007. So the EU consumption of global cropland already exceeds the suggested target for global cropland per capita if we want to stop uh, the loss of 
about diversity. So here I will say global land use is a key indicator of global sustainability and must be assessed and monitored to keep crop land expansion within safe operating system. We must therefore be more efficient in the way we produce, supply, and consume our land-based product. We must restore more than we degrade. And restoring more than we degrade, I believe, is possible. The report in reference from UNEP asserted that the reduced uh, consumption and improved land management to save land might allow saving of 161 million to 319 million hectares of land by 2050 in that range. It has been estimated that 90 to 225 million hectares might be degraded during that period. And among the saving sources, consider, they considered that restoration might be possible for one third only of, of the land surface that might be degraded during that period. So in finding answers to how to operate the unavoidable expansion of cropland, I think the two following questions need further consideration. It's that how much is the amount of degraded land that can still be restored? Can we afford just to look at how we, we prevent degradation from the, of in the future, or we should also get involved in restoring the land that is already degraded? And what is possible? At what cost? and to whose interest? And what, therefore, could we do while we are looking for avoiding degradation? What could we do in ensuring that we restore our degraded land? In that regard, I believe that a major policy seed has been sown at the June 1912 UN Conference on Sustainable Development. Because building or reaffirming that desertification, land degradation, and drought are challenges of global dimension that continue to pose serious challenges to the sustainable development of all countries, especially developing one. The summit decided, number one, to strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world. Second, to monitor land degradation globally and to restore degraded land, especially in dry land to improve science and science policy interface to address those issues, and to improve cooperation for information sharing and early warning system. But some people say it is unrealistic or overly ambitious. And other question whether the objective is sufficiently ambitious. I think the goal is not just to go land degradation neutral. The goal is to ensure that as soon as possible, and no later than 2030, we will reach the level where we will restore as much as we degrade, which means we must reduce degradation to the unavoidable and compensate by land being restored as soon as possible, and I hope no later than 2030. And if this was uh, further elaborated on, if you take the, the the element proposed by the report of the UNEP, you will see that it will imply that we restore more than one third of what will be degraded. Because we have to not only reduce degradation, but all that has been degraded, we must compensate by not being restored, and all that has been sealed has been also uh, has to be uh, compensated. And you see, here we have uh, historical changes leading to degradation. And I have said in 1990, we have seen acceleration in degradation. And here we are in 2000, uh, where we have had a number of assessment, global assessment of degradation and restoration, including the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And since then, there have been ongoing changes. So the idea here is to ensure that by 2030, we have the same amount of biologically and economically productive land, including soil and its ecosystem services as in 2000. That's what it means to go land degradation neutral. And beyond 2030 to restore more than we degrade. We can't afford to forsake our legacy of degraded land. 
Because if you look at it, not only we can't withstand it, but it is economically, biologically productive to go the other way around and go land degradation neutral, which will actually be a framework to bring together and uh, all that helps to and contribute to restoration. And in that regard, I believe that the potential for restoration is huge, but not yet known, or not to the extent that we can build on it and take action. When you think that degradation is what it is, but restoration can provide all that we have discussed, then to offer a few points of as takeaway, I would say unchecked and unregulated expansion of global agricultural land as well as seeing of fertile soil are leading the world towards systemic crisis. Land degradation is predictable and is driven by policies and market failures at all levels and is impeding the sustainable development of all countries. Degraded land are underperforming assets. Therefore, efficient use, prevention, and restoration should attract investment. So we must confront the myth attached, the myth and the misconception, the misperception attached to degradation and restoration. The science and the knowledge about it has to be improved. We really need to address that type of scene of omission regarding the issue of land degradation and restoration as one of your uh, uh, and three American scientists call it a scene of omission, where they, they, they noticed that in 2000, not they noticed, they, they highlighted the fact that in 2012 context, there have been eight times more articles published in 2012 regarding or referring to climate change compared to land degradation and soil degradation. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to offer as conclusion that, well, as human beings, we often forget our past harmful deeds, and sometimes we forgive. However, never, never does nature forget nor forgive. Nature never forgets nor forgives. It relentlessly operates according to its principle. So failing to align to those principles is like choosing to disappear. So to conclude, I would like to offer that quote, which is from the Veda Sanskrit, Sanskrit scripture, 1500 BC. Upon this handful of soil, our survival depends. Has bound it, and it will grow our food, our fuel, and our shelter, and surround us with beauty. Abuse it, and the soil will collapse and die, taking humanity with it, unquote. We are, as a historical fact, a desert-making species. So my hope is that this generation will initiate the restoration age. Thank you. So we have some times for questions. Let's put up, let's see, there's another slide right here, I think. Is this it? No. Nope. Get to the last Why slide. Can I get this slide here? So it's from hashtag ISCL2014. They'll be fed over here. And Mark is going to run around with a microphone uh, for those who would like to ask a question. And uh, so if we'll show by hands, if you want to ask a question, Mark will bring you the microphone so we can all hear it. Bruce, Bruce Monger up right there. And then you can answer. Yeah.
the, the ongoing interaction in New York to agree on sustainable development goals has covered all possible aspects. What has been done in the last 12 months has been to take stock on what is possible, including options for reducing or improving uh, our consumption patterns towards sustainability, and uh, of course also improving our uh, production patterns. So, of course, uh, reducing uh, uh, the, may I say, the consumption of meat to reduce pressure on, on grassland is part of that. Uh, but is again another societal question. You can't just take a, a decree and say we all go for. No, it has to be a society deciding uh, towards uh, the, the commonly shared objectives. But it has been considered. More questions? Over there. Ah, over here, okay. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Uh, a follow-up question, the, the, thank you for giving uh, uh, so much respect to the Peanut Report. That was a thought that just came up. One of our conclusions, though, was that uh, in addition to trying to protect the land and to help the land be restored, that society needs to move to a much more aggressive use of consumption power, so that this reaches questions dealing with meat consumption, but also biofuels. And the report explicitly says that without cutting uh, meat consumption in the Western world by half, and without cutting biofuel projection into the Western world by two-thirds, that we really are not going to have a sustainable land use. Uh, we debated a lot in the report whether to say that. That's what the science seems to do, but uh, we were warned that it seemed politically naive. That's my hope. Uh, and congratulations again. Uh, I understand you have been part of the team who has actually uh, brought the, that report. And you know, I wish that report was available just one year earlier. Because when I was pushing for going land degradation neutral or at least ensuring that we restore more than we degrade, many governments we're actually challenging the, the, that stand, and even today, you must be aware that even in your midst, some of the scientists do not agree that we have to go that way. So, well, I hope that it will. What I'm highlighting here is that even the reports have not really taken a clear stand regarding the already degraded land. What shall we do about that? It has just said that in the future, we must make sure that we, we reduce the degradation, that one third of the degraded land shall be restored. But my point is, not only we ought to do that, but any option to expansion, to expand in crop land should consider potential for restoration. And the Global uh, Partnership for Forest and Landscape restoration, restoration saying that we have up to two billion hectares of land with that still have potential for restoration. People might not really agree on that, that figure, but the point is it's, it's vast there. But here, here is my point on that. Even that one is conservative because what is happening in Zender or in Niger is, has not been mapped in that partnership assessment. signs of hope that world policy makers are waking up to the importance of healthy soil and land degradation neutrality? Um, <laughs> I can't just help myself is not to be optimistic. I always strive to see the glass half full. Half full. So the discussions in New York has helped to further build on the provision from Rio. You know, in, 19, in 2011, when I said we need to go that avenue, people told me, forget about it. I asked the General Assembly to call for a high-level meeting on land degradation, land restoration. They say it's not possible, that we have no budget, any, but we have had it. And it, it has taken place in September 20th, 2011. And that's where 
the idea of going land degradation neutral gained some ground and some traction. So I really hope that despite there's people who are, are rather dropping the idea of having a specific goal on land stewardship, that they say they will rather work to have target across all the other goals, which I welcome, but there are many, uh, many options. I really hope that the target of ensuring and monitoring, uh, ensuring that uh, we have global stewardship in place and monitoring global use of agricultural land will make it through the sustainable goals and sustainable development goals and targets. I'm hopeful. I am. Thank you, Luke, um, uh, for the excellent talk. Uh, Cornell University has a, a large um, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences uh, and has a vision to be one of the leaders in agriculture, education, and science uh, in the next century. This century. What, what is your aspiration, your, your hope that such a university, uh, what role it could play um, at the world stage on the UN platform? And a few concrete examples how scientists and the university uh, can play a major role. Thank you, Alice. Um, when I took the help of the university in 2007, one of my targets was to uh, reach out to uh, American scientists. Uh, I, uh, my assumption was that having experienced the Dust Bowl, you have gathered a, a lot of experience regarding the, the risk of you know, soil being you know, uh, misused, mismanaged. And it's true. Uh, when you consider what uh, President Roosevelt said when he was signing that, uh, that law, it's, you, can, you just take what you have said, you translate it at the global stage, and you have what we're talking about. But amazingly, uh, one could expect the, the, the U.S. to play that role at the global level, but of course some other considerations are, are now in, entered into play. So I really hope that universities like Cornell can help bring the interdisciplinary way of connecting the science to help decision makers to see what they ought to do that scientists will not further confuse decision makers by bringing piecemeal information to them, which is uh, of no use for decision makers, that rather the uh, bringing all that is, been, that is known, discussing within scientists, and it's not easy uh, I, to bring scientists to agree. You just have a look at the discussion on the IPCC, and it's worse than diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> but, so now imagine that this is brought to decision makers, for them to find a way in that. Interdisciplinary approaches are very much needed today. And better understanding how human beings make decisions, not just about science. When I was really a bit desperate in 2012 about uh, you know, succeeding in selling the idea, a, a, a friend of mine who is a senior uh, uh, American diplomat told me, look, have peace. Uh, Government don't make decisions just based on knowledge and science or what science has made available. They have many other reasons about that. So don't feel like it's about you. <laughs> it's not about you. Uh, that's, and negotiations uh, position of government is not built on what science has made known. So interdisciplinary approaches are very much needed. The Arkansas Center for a Sustainable Future and Cornell University as a whole could really advance that and bring uh, ways to connect uh, what science is making available and improve understanding of how human beings make deci decisions uh, and maybe connect big data to, to all that and, and help uh, decision makers to make better decisions. Beyond outreach and education, now we can incentivize better management of So how can we incentivize better management of ag lands to sustain ecosystem services, payment for 
electrical system services. You have very good example in the US. Uh, one of the things that we studied uh, when I was in Harvard was the, the case of New York City, uh, you know, grappling with the very high cost of water management and provision good water for the city of New York. And what, what are the alternatives? And what are, in fact, what, what is the alternative to building bigger and bigger, uh, you know, plan to treat uh, water? The conclusion has been clear. Incentivizing those upstream uh, who are uh, land managers was the best way for New York City to ensure that they have water in quantity and in quality. So New York dwellers have interest. New York City dwellers have interest in therefore paying for those services. And there are many ways of doing that. So I have seen those type of examples, and I actually I used to refer to it, saying uh, when we talk about urban-rural uh, uh, interactions, improving urban-rural interaction in a, a world which is much more moving towards urbanization is key. When you take the example of China, they have very uh, they have challenges in that context. How will they improve urban-rural interaction, ensure that uh, eco payment for ecosystem services will be in place to improve their air quality, to improve their wa water systems, will be key for China's uh, development in the, in the next years. So the responses are there. In fact, uh, I, I, we, we have built uh, what we call a capacity building marketplace uh, in the UNCCD, where it's about uh, uploading uh, success story, good uh, responses to some of the issues, and giving an opportunity to those uh, looking for options about their challenges to also go there and, and match and connect. Uh, I was in Ang Angola, and in Angola they wanted to uh, protect uh, a, a city uh, nearby uh, the Namib Desert, where they, they, they are moving sand dunes. And I was surprised to see what they did. They, what they did was an afforestation program, they plant trees, and they have to uh, plant trees with, uh, um, how do you say, guta good, um, uh, with drip irrigation system in place. How come? It, you know, it, and, over five years, they have to stop the program because it, it was too expensive in, in water use. But at the same time, nearby, there are many other ways of stopping, you know, uh, uh, land dune move, and which are much more cost e e effective and even efficient. So it is important to share uh, good practices, both uh, uh, on, at the field level but at the policy level, and we need to advance that. So I think we'd like to thank Mr. Uh, so one, one there. There are going to be more, and there'll be a few seconds to come up to come up and talk. But I think we should, at this point, thank you. Um, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.